Hey, welcome back to Wounded for War, guys. Uh, today, we are going to start a new series. We're going to jump right into the book of Acts and go through verse by verse. Uh, I believe that um, as I've been praying and, and seeking God on what is on His heart for people watching uh, this channel, is, is that He would uh, show them and reveal to them, He's shown me that, that He wants you to see uh, a healthy empowerment by him for the calling that he has on your life. And, uh, and, and also just to, to see the things that the Lord does through his apostles in the early church and kind of look at our lives and see where we measure up against that. So we're going to dive in, uh, in Acts 1. And we're going to cover uh, five verses today. It's notable that from the very beginning, he starts in chapter one uh, and says, In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. In my first book, I told you, he's referencing, and he being Luke, is the writer of Acts. But what he's referencing is his first book he wrote, which was the, the Gospel of Luke. Now he's writing a sequel to that. You could take the book of Luke and the book of Acts and pair them. They're really almost uh, just one book from Jesus' uh, inception, birth, coming all the way to his death, and then uh, resurrection, all of a sudden, the calling on the apostles moves forward in the book of Acts. So, um, it, this is why it's important for us to, to study uh, this book at this time. Uh, so, before we dive in, let me pray for our time. Lord, I lift up to you this time, I ask first and foremost that I would get out of the way that, Lord, you would speak uh, through this time to your church, to your people, that you would also draw those who are, are not your people, but find themselves listening to this. Lord, I pray that you would teach us by your Holy Spirit, that you would reveal to us your Holy Spirit's empowerment this morning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So he writes this book, and who's he writing it to? He says he, he's writing it to Theophilus. Uh, Theophilus is um, essentially um, a, a guy that in history, uh, we've, we have two versions of, of what the church believes. is one that he was a, a man, uh, oftentimes a doctor would actually be a slave uh, back then uh, to a rich owner. And so it's likely that Luke is actually a slave of Theophilus and Theophilus is funding this trip to go out and to, hey, go find this, this Jesus and give me a report. And that's one version of what history tells us. The other history is that the word Theophilus actually means lover of God. And so some theologians believe um, and scholars believe that, that uh, it was a, a book written to the church and, and, he, and he's just using the word, hey, lovers of God, this book is to you. Um, either way, all scripture uh, is breathed out by God and good for reproof and correction and building up of the body. So we can take this book, whether it was written to one man or to all of us, and we can learn and study it and, and grow from it. And, uh, and one of the things that we also need to know about Luke is that he was a doctor by trade. And so because he was a doctor by trade, he was actually, um, he well studied in the science of the day. So this guy is um, also the only Gentile that's in the group of the apostles. So what does that have to do with us today? Well, it's, it's like taking a non-churched person. 
someone that never stepped foot in a church and literally, and you just tell them, hey, I know that you are a scientist and you don't believe in church, but what I want you to do is I want you to follow that pastor. And I want you to, uh, to write down all that he does, study it, and then to verify it as true or false. So it's it's quite a uh, a setup, if you will, because this is the book that's well known for uh, all this miraculous works of God, these miracles of healing, these people that stretch out an arm and and it was once lame, or where uh, we're going to see Peter take a man and, and tell him, "Hey, rise up and walk," and this guy's been lame for uh, years and. And so it would be really great to have someone that's somewhat skeptical already. Maybe that's a lot like you. Maybe you uh, find yourself in a, in a place of skepticism about the church. Well, you're in good company and, and God seems to be comfortable with that because he's saying, hey, here's a whole story based on, I, I, I made a story just for you. So what does he do? with this guy, Luke, he, he, uh, he says in the, the latter part of that, he says that, um, until the day he was taken up to heaven after that being Jesus, after giving his chosen apostles, Luke being one further instructions through the Holy spirit. Notice he says he's given them instructions and he's God, he's Jesus, but he did it through the Holy Spirit. That's gonna be very important, extremely important. Why? Because remember when the Holy Spirit fell upon Jesus at his baptism? When John was baptizing him and he came up, it said that uh, what looked like a dove came and fell upon Jesus and it was the Holy Spirit. And he was, he was baptized himself in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's where he taught from. That's where he instructed from, not by his own godly power, but literally through the Holy Spirit's empowerment. Why? Why would he choose to do that? Because he was modeling for us, you and me, that we could also be empowered through this Holy Spirit that he would leave. The, uh, the instructions. He gave them three years of instructions. It was like the best seminary you could ever go to. Take 12 guys and just sit them down with God, Jesus, and, and let him let them look at him and, and learn and watch his action and his words and how he treated people. It's one of the best seminaries that you could ever attend. He says in... Um, in Matthew 28, 19, what our calling is. What, what we would need to be empowered for. Let me read it. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. That, my friends, is a heavy calling. I'm going to go make disciples of all the nations and to baptize people. And I thought only pastors and, and, and teachers do that. No, he's saying to all his disciples, that's your life pursuit from here on out. So then it would be important for us to really trust, for us to really have settled in our hearts and in our minds. Uh, who Jesus is, who the Holy Spirit is, and how he works. But notice, you and I might be in good company if we doubt sometimes, if we struggle with that sometimes. And I'll, I'll show you why. In verse 3, he says, During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time. So, this is the risen Jesus. He's, he's now suffered and died, but he appeared to the apostles after that from time to time. Why? And he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. 
something he had already instructed them on and talked to them about. So this was a way that he could, in in one sense, hey guys, I need you, I need you to know that I'm still alive. I need you to know that um, what I promised uh, that I would defeat death uh, is is actually happened. You know, I love the fact that it says he appeared to them. Let me let me give you a, an account where he actually appeared to them. I want to read this little um, part for you. It says early on the first day of the week after he had risen, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and reported to those who had been with him as they were mourning and weeping. Yet when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe it. They're weeping, they're mourning, they're struggling. They, they, they want their Messiah back. He told them many times that, hey, in front of the, the Pharisees and Sadducees, uh, hey guys, I'm gonna, I'll destroy this temple and I'll raise it back up. And he was speaking of himself. He told his disciples what would happen and yet they did not believe when it happened. It says after this, uh, he appeared in different, in a different form to two of them walking on their way into the country. And they went and reported it to the rest who did not believe them either. Isn't that amazing? These are men, 12 men that spent three years walking and talking with Jesus. And the very first thing they do is struggle with belief. Maybe, maybe you are there. I know I've been there. I've struggled. I've had my moments and God has been gracious to love on me and care for me and show me that he is real. In the same way he says, and he proved to them, showed them in many ways. He's done that for me. You know, he actually still uses them. Do you feel unuseful to God because of your doubt? Well, they doubted two different people. And then after that, it says, later he appeared to the 11 themselves as they were reclining at the table. He rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who saw him after he had risen. He corrected them, but he still commissioned them and he still empowered them, gifted them, loved on them. Is that the God that you want to meet? The one that has mercy, that has grace, that cares for those that struggle with belief? In verse four, going on, it says, once when he was eating with them, I love that. Do, do dead people eat? Isn't that one of those moments in many ways he proved to them? If I'm sitting with a guy that's supposed to be dead and he's eating, a dinner in front of me, he's obviously not dead. He commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. So these guys are struggling with their belief, but he's, but Jesus is saying, hey, I have to empower you before you actually go out and do any of this work anything in my name. What, what promise is that? That promise is of the Holy Spirit. In Joel, uh, the book of Joel, chapter two, verse 28, it says, after this, I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams and your young men will see visions. How do we get this Holy Spirit empowerment that he's talking about right there? Well, in verse five, it tells us John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is a very controversial area. 
in church history. The difference between water baptism and baptized in the Holy Spirit. This is one of the texts that shows us that the two aren't just one, that they are two separate things. John baptized with water. All of you guys have been baptized. But in just a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You haven't been empowered yet by the Holy Spirit. Like Jesus was for the three years of ministry. What is the difference between water baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit? There's a verse that says, John came baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance. He was baptizing in water and it was a baptism of repentance, but for the forgiveness of sins. That's what that's for. He, he's baptizing in water and, and for repentance and forgiveness in sins. Man, you're in Christ. You've been forgiven of your sins. However, the baptism of the Holy Spirit follows in suit with this. And look, I am sending you what my father promised. Notice, didn't he just say, wait for what my father promised? I'm sending you what my father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. As the first one was for the, the forgiveness of sins, this one now is for you are empowered. Wait till you're empowered from on high. Not your power, not a natural proclivity towards this or that, or hey, I'm a great speaker, gifted that. No, it's gifting that God would give you that you would need, that you otherwise would fail at. Not some eloquent speaker, though, can God use that? Sure. I often see, though, he uses the, the weak things of the world or uh, the foolish things of the world. Maybe you've heard that verse. He even says the base things of the world, the garbage, the refuse. He uses low things not high-minded. Maybe that's encouraging to you. Who knows? Maybe it, it is to me, for sure. We need an empowerment. The, impossible, the apostles are, are going to be called to things that they could never do on their own. Jesus literally said that, I'm going to send you out and you're going to do greater things that I, than I did. So... Obviously, in that moment, they've seen him raise people from the dead. They've seen him do so many things, right, that were miraculous. And and they're thinking, uh, yeah, I need a big power, a serious power. You know that that word uh, that's often equated with the Holy Spirit, the power, the the upon experience. There's three Greek prepositions that come along with uh, the, the the person and work of the Holy Spirit: in, with, and upon. Epi, para, and en in the Greek. In this case, with the Holy Spirit, it is the upon experience. Jesus, well, the Holy, the Holy Spirit, the best way to, to explain this is he is in or he is with the, the, the individual as he's drawing, the Holy Spirit is drawing them into Christ. Okay, so he's with or alongside and then he's, he's also known as in. So now the Holy Spirit comes within you. He is now dwelling in you and you it literally says that you are the temple of the living God, that the Holy Spirit dwells within you. That's the in experience. But then there's an empowerment. There's an empowerment that comes upon you for the work of making disciples and living out the supernatural life that God has, has tailor made for you and I. Now, however, some conservatives, I mean, it, there's a lot of people that have questions on this because there's a lot of different church expressions out there. And the, and the issue is, is that some conservatives on this matter throw out the very idea of the Holy Spirit working through people. 
You might go into a church and you never hear about the Holy Spirit. Um, I have noticed that in the work up here, or the general church up in the Pacific Northwest, there's a big lack of teaching on the Holy Spirit and His work and empowerment. And a lot of people just living um, out of their own strength to do the things that they're called to do. There's also the other side of the, the coin though. There's, there's a lot of people that would, um, that have gone so far after the miraculous and signs and wonders that they literally go after that as their chief pursuit and forget that Jesus is actually um, what we're supposed to be pursuing, not the signs and wonders. You see, we're going to see in the later uh, chapters here that um, the apostles won't be chasing after signs and wonders. However, signs and wonders will follow the apostles as they're obedient to the calling that Christ has on their their life. Because signs and wonders are to be a proof to the message. You see, when when you or I look at that individual in our life, that's just, uh, I'll call it a low life. Some scumbag, a scumbag that, that you just look at and you're like, man, that person can amount to nothing. A waste of skin. And then a year goes by and you see them again. And all of a sudden they're fruitful. They're, they're, they're working. They're, they're a productive part of society. They have light in them, uh, completely different. There's something new. And, and literally they say, yeah, that's, that's, you know, I, I've been born again, or I'm a Christian or I'm following Christ or I'm apprenticing. I like apprenticing under Jesus. Those are the types of proofs that we need to see in the church today. You know, I want to use this as an opportunity to give you an opportunity to experience the empowerment of God. Do you have any pain in your life? Do you have any uh, need for healing or supernatural strength to carry on? Maybe you, maybe you need supernatural strength to stop doing something you know is destructive in your life or marriage. Or maybe you just want purpose in your life. Why don't you pray with me, if that's you. Lord, I lift up the individuals that are watching this, Lord. And I just pray that um, you would gift them with your presence, Lord. That you would help them to come to know you in such a rich, intangible way, Lord. That even though they may doubt, Lord, that you would in many ways prove to them that you, Lord, are God. I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon them. Gift them with the giftings and anointings that are needed. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come back next week for part two. Uh, moving on through the book of Acts. Love you guys. Talk to you soon.